So as always, lots of little beautiful nuggets within these readings. Um, looking first at the church in Colossae, these are the Colossians, something that they struggled with is something that we could almost think of in our day with the term New Age. So they struggled with putting a certain kind of worship in things that were not of God, things of creation that were beautiful, but kind of holding on to them in a way that that should only be reserved to holding on to God. And they would do this also with angels. Sometimes we find this too, that sense of maybe persons recognizing a spiritual realm, but maybe not necessarily giving allegiance to God, but saying, well, there's this kind of spiritual thing over here, and I hold on to it, this kind of force or whatever, or there's this kind of being or, um, you know, just different, different things which are below God, and yet we make them the thing that we hold on to. And that's what the Church of the Colossians, the people there, they needed to be purified of that. And so this hymn that's being, that's being sung um, at this first letter, or this um, first chapter of Colossians, is actually Paul reminding the people that Jesus Christ is above everything. So it goes on saying, he is the image, the icon of the invisible God. And that doesn't mean that he's just kind of second rate. It's when we see, as Jesus himself taught us, when we see the face of Jesus, an icon is a window. It leads us to see the face of God because Jesus reveals to us the face of his Father, and him and the Father are one. So when we see Jesus and him as the image of the invisible God, the God that we can't see, he reveals himself to us. He gives us a picture of who he is. It's a window to be able to see God. He's the firstborn of all creation. He's a new Adam because who's the firstborn of original creation it is, is Adam. But he's the firstborn of all creation redeemed, but also he was there before Adam existed. And firstborn, notice it doesn't say he's the first created of all creation because Jesus always was. But he's the firstborn, which means he's the son that receives the inheritance. And what is the inheritance? All of creation, to be king and lord over it. That's why in the book of the prophet Daniel, you have this image, you have all these, this, this kind of weird statue, and it all represents all these different kingdoms, and they all crumble down. And then it says, one like a son of man, coming on the clouds, and he came before the ancient one of days, to receive an everlasting kingdom. That's what's being said here. Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, is coming and receiving from the Heavenly Father his, his, his kingship, his lordship over all of this. And he's created, he created for in him, he created all things in heaven and on earth. So he was part of creation. It wasn't just God the Father saying, let there be light, but it was Father, Son, and Spirit working together to bring forth creation, which means he's not part of creation. He's above it, and he's Lord of it. And he's Lord over not just the visible things that we can see, but the invisible things that we, can, that we can't see, which means he's Lord over every single angelic being. And that's what it says after. It says, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, each one of those are the choirs of angels. The different choirs of angels, that's what's being said here. So it's, he's saying he's above all of that, and he's before all things. And in him all things hold together. And that's important because if, if we look within our own world, within our own heart, sin disintegrates. It breaks us apart. 
it leads to discommunion versus communion, disunity. And yet Jesus, when he becomes Lord of our life, he integrates every single part of us. He integrates our family, our marriage, our recreation, our study, our exercise, all these different things, and he brings them so that they all like work together. And that's where we find a true wholeness. That's where we find peace. The very word shalom is when everything is working together as it should. Shalom is not just an absence of war, because you can have a lot of brokenness, even though there's no technical war. And yet in Jesus, all the pieces come together. The broken pieces of our humanity are healed, renewed. They're reconciled because it says here, it says, through him, he was to reconcile all things for him. And the way that he does this, he makes peace. Remember, peace, shalom. He brings things to work together. How? By the blood of his cross. So the blood of Jesus connects us. It takes the pieces that maybe, kind of like a child who sort of takes a puzzle and kind of throws them up in the air or is trying to like, you know, put them together and they're not fitting well. The blood of Jesus washes over all aspects of our life and connects them and brings them to that wholeness that we're seeking. It brings us to the new wineskin. That's what's being said in the gospel here. You can't have old wine or new wine into old wineskins. Jesus wants to give this new wine, this new life, this new way of being. But he wants to remake us. He wants to put the puzzle together in a way even more beautiful than you can imagine. But one of the struggles that we find is it says, no one who has been drinking old wine desires new. For he says, the old is good. Sometimes our greatest obstacle is comfortability. Sometimes we don't want to be healed. We don't want to be reconciled deeply. We don't want to experience that deep shalom because we've kind of settled for something else. We've settled for an old wine. And we're used to that. Sometimes when you drink something new, you know, at first it, it might be a little jarring. Just think of the first time you drank coffee. You might have been tempted to be like, oh man, this is horrible. But maybe after a while, you start realizing that's so much better than pop. But you have to go, as a child, you're used to just the sugary. This is bitter. This is, I used to call it burnt tree bark. And yet, when you allow that shock of something new to little by little go in, and you have to do it through a remade person, which is what Jesus wants to do. He wants to bring you into a wholeness, into an integrity, so that he can pour his Holy Spirit, which is so much better than coffee, to pour that into you. And there may be the temptation to say, no, Lord, I I'm fine with my relationship the way that it is with you. I, I like the idea of being an acquaintance with you. I like the idea of, you know, in, in a sense, I like the idea of dating you, Lord, and not being married to you. Because I can have a lot more space, I can have freedom, I can be able to do what I want, but if I'm a spouse to you, then I've given my whole life to you, and I'm not ready for that kind of relationship. Maybe the old wine is that. I, I want my freedom. I want to be able to say, God, you're there when I need you, but when I'm okay, I'd rather do things on my own. And the Lord is saying, no, I'm a jealous God. I made you to marry you, to espouse you. I want all of you. 
and I want to remake you through the blood of my son, Jesus Christ, so that you can receive the new wine of the Spirit in a way that fills you with a peace and a joy and a sober intoxication that doesn't take away your senses, but actually makes you even more alive the way that you were meant to be. So pray about that. Ask yourself the question, what's the old wine that I'm still holding on to? What is that thing that I'm comfortable with and I don't want to, I don't want to be remade? And have courage to ask the Lord, Lord, help me to be open. Help me to receive a new wineskin so that you can fill me with your spirit.